This episode of Grilled by the Staff Canteen is sponsored by Westlands, the premier specialist British grower of microleaf, growing cresses, edible flowers, inspired leaves, sea herbs and specialty tomatoes. Visit www.westlandsuk.co.uk to find out more. Thanks for downloading Grilled by the Staff Canteen. In this episode, our deputy editor Tani caught up with Nina Matsunaga, uh, chef and co-owner of the Black Bull in Sedbra. Listed at number 26 in the top 50 UK gastro pubs, Nina is one of only five female chefs in the top 50 list. Hello everyone and welcome to the Grilled podcast. I'm here today with uh, Nina from the Black Bull in Sedbra. So Nina is the chef and co-owner of the Three Hairs and the Black Bull, which was uh, this year named 26 in the top 50. 50 gastro pubs. Um, so Nina was raised in Dusseldorf in Germany to Japanese parents um, and she's here today to tell us a little bit about how she got to her present levels of success and we're gonna, we're gonna obviously have a little chat about the, um, the C word and I don't mean the rude one I just mean coronavirus. <laughs> so how are you doing Nina? I'm all right thank you. Good good so what, what have you been up to since lockdown started? So we, in the first sort of months, I think we were quite, we weren't really sure what we were doing. And it was all a bit, a little bit un, unsure. I mean, nobody knew it would go on this long, especially not until, until probably now. Um, I think we kind of thought maybe, but I think we we're all hoping for sooner. Uh, so we didn't, you know, it's the typical kind of panicking every day, what, what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. Um, and then since then, to be honest, I mean, we've, we've kept ourselves a little bit busy by just, you know, cleaning jobs, tidying, um, actually having a life, um, yeah. which is normally quite hard after seven days of work for, you know, nearly six years, seven years since we've had our own business, really seven days, really every day, um, suddenly having months on end, really without anything. It's been, it's, yeah, you just discover things that you haven't really done. You know, there's things like, hobbies and books and other people that you can speak to and I don't know it's 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 been it's been good in that way but yeah. it's been quite hard because although we were practically not doing anything the days just fly by so I don't know what I'm going to do when I go back to work really <laughs> have you learned any new any new skills um relearned I suppose um it's more trying out recipes and things that may, might have not that don't have really a place at work that are more sort of you know home cooking or skill and they you know bits of different cuisines that we wouldn't really use there um also a lot of walking and a lot of exercising I don't yeah. think I've ever I, although we exercise every day I, I still feel like I'm you know I'm not capable of doing anything <laughs> you know it's got um, covering muscles in your body you never knew were there yeah it's, uh, it, you know when when you're younger it, it it feels so easy you know you you take a month out or something for sports and then suddenly you're back in and you do, it's no problem whatsoever but when you get a bit older you, you kind of do feel it quite a bit you lose and, it a lot faster yeah yeah so we've done we've done a lot of um you know we, we get finally get to watch a lot of movies and you know discover a bit of arts and read a lot of books so it, it's yeah it's been quite good that way yeah and so what position were you in at, as lockdown started did you did you see it coming did you anticipate that you were going to have to close what was your sort of stance at all? we did we kept thinking it was that monday the the last week and we, we thought it was would be on the monday but obviously we didn't get shut down until friday which was a little bit difficult really because we did become quite quiet during the evenings to be honest I think the whole town got very quiet and everybody was really unsure of what was going to happen um so we did kind of see it coming I think there's always that sort of 10 percent glimmer of hope that you think you know it'll just blow over it will you know it'll be fine um from a business point of view I suppose you you kind of want it but at the same time I think there was quite a lot of panic in the last you know, in the week last week before the official sort of big lockdown, that yeah. a lot of people were worried, and you know, our staff wasn't. To be fair, it's just the customers really that were that were a bit unsure whether they should go out, go out and come out. So, yeah, we were we were in a. So we'd just been into the top fifty gastro pubs 
we yeah. actually were anticipating some other reviews or um, sort of visits from other inspectors of different kinds. So hopefully that will just get delayed rather than, yeah, so just completely forgotten about. Yeah, from the, from the statements, the various sort of groups have issued, it sounds like they're trying to keep things on track to an extent. Uh, but it's all up in the air, isn't it? It's so hard to know. Yeah. It's, it's just gonna, everything is just gonna be pushed back by six, six months, a year. And um, would, you, would you say that you're ready to reopen again? Are you excited to reopen again? Yeah, um, there's that it's sort of, I think it's a sort of typical, when, when you've been in a job that's quite, it, it might not be necessarily demanding in the way that, you know, we save the world, that kind of thing, you know, or we, we kind of, um, you know, a super important job, but it is, it is quite, it can be quite stressful and is, you know, you, you're responsible for quite a lot of people and, uh, you know, and, and jobs really and you're wanting to make sure that you do it right or that you feel rested enough and whatnot you know and you know that the stress is coming basically but at the same time we, are, we I think we're ready pretty much to start working I think um, this is the longest time I've ever not worked since school so it's, <laughs> it's really it feels a little bit it, it just feel a little bit surreal a little bit like a, you know like a, we're in like a very odd science fiction film at the moment but yeah, things are starting to get a little bit back to normal with most of the jobs and other people sort of around us starting to go back to their jobs. So I think, yeah, we're pretty much ready. It'd be nice to try out, you know, to, to change our direction maybe slightly and in the way that we always wanted to do it and, and see yeah. how that's perceived. So it's, like, it's been a little bit like of a, a pause for reflection for you so you can sort of steer it in a different direction if you want to. Yeah, I think so. I think it's quite similar for quite a lot of a lot of places. I mean, there's a lot of cafes and things that have turned into sort of essential shops, and yeah. you know, um, just just completely changed their approach to takeouts of where they might have not done them before that they're doing them now. I think it's quite a good time, really, to introduce maybe different lines or to introduce different things that you haven't done before. Yeah, and how how do you feel about what the sort of government liners at the moment in terms of what they think you know restaurants are going to need to do to be able to reopen as soon as possible in terms of the spaces between the tables and down and all of that where are you, where do you stand on that yeah most of them will be um so our space our floor space itself is quite big so where we could have probably fit in previously sort of between 80 and 90 people some in the bar and you know throughout the restaurant we with proper social distancing sort of one meter 50 would be better than two meters but we can still manage quite well and we can we can uphold the two meters um there's no guidelines that are official for restaurants as yet i'm guessing because basically they've not reopened so nobody knows mm -hmm. um i think most people will expect two meters at least one meter 50 um so it is possible for us and we do have an outside space as well which um, nobody else really in the town has mm -hmm. so we can see quite a few people outside that's obviously depending on if the weather is all right um, we have a bit of a sort of a stables outside that we turned into an outside bar last year so we can seat a few people in there or I mean they can you know have sort of casual drinking out there with proper social distancing um, we have the bit of cover for outside so yeah, we should be. We should be all right. Um, it's not ideal, obviously. I mean, nobody thinks that's ideal. But at the same time, I don't think I would personally, or we would, as a family, personally go out and really, you know, stuff ourselves into a small space like what mm -hmm. we've done previously. Yeah. You probably think about it a little bit more before you go out. And I suppose it puts everyone on a sort of level playing field, you know, that all restaurants and all bars are in the same situation so you might be losing out but yeah you know, you're probably going to get the same percentage of business as everybody else if that makes sense yeah i think at the minute you can't really quite tell i mean unless really nobody was to come and as you said i mean i think people will just go to different places or maybe if they can't get into one place then they'll go into another you know where it's slightly less busy on that one particular night um so yeah i think at the minute i wouldn't 
I'm trying not to panic about that side of worrying that there'll be nobody coming in or that people will be, you know, that we're missing out. I think it's probably not really the right standpoint. I think it is looking at how we can most safely deliver, you know, what we do best uh, for our staff and especially for the customers that we would like to retain. I mean, there's quite a lot of locals and regulars that I'm pretty sure that will be coming in, but just making sure that they, they won't be put off by, you know, yeah. by panic making. Yeah, so I guess it's about being able to show that you're doing the right things. Yeah. There's positivity in examples from other countries. Australia reopened a lot of its restaurants uh, in the past few days. And people have, you know, they've flocked back to restaurants because they've been told that it's safe to do so. I think lots of people are excited to go back and eat out, but they want to know that they can do so safely. And what, what's the situation? Did you manage to get to keep all of your staff throughout this? Yeah, we have. Yeah. Um, so we do have quite a few. I mean, there's around 30 odd people. Um, so we have retained and they're all on furlough at the moment. Um, and they, yeah, we don't know how you know what what's going to happen after we're opening we just have to see who who can come back first or there'll be people that be furloughed and then other people that come back and then maybe swapping over but we don't we can't really quite say anything yet because of obviously not even having a date set for us when we can yeah. possibly reopen um um when it, when it comes to sort of your suppliers and your guests have you kept in touch with them have you got any sort of a sense of how your suppliers are doing and you know are your guests sort of rearing to come back um so we work with a couple of larger wholesale suppliers we have been in touch with them throughout this um a couple of them have actually helped out with some of the hospital meals so just being able to donate or help out um we the other thing that we do is we buy direct like cattle and things directly from farms so we keep in touch with the people that basically will be supplying our beef or our lamb and, and pigs for the future um obviously it's had an impact on them massively um and but they have the advantage i mean they can just keep you know some of their cattle grazing or they can just keep it alive basically although it's not ideal because obviously they would have at a specific point they would like to basically dispatch them but you know we kind of we did manage to keep in touch with them and they so far i mean i think they seem to be quite understanding because we don't have anywhere to we don't have we can't take them so you know they understand that in that in their perspective um we also have a couple of people that sort of you know grow vegetables around here or our gardener that help uh, that we've just sort of gotten on board last year um and we're trying to delay sort of you know our own crops a little bit and yeah. you know or trying to find new ways of maybe keeping them or drying things out and whatnot so yeah we've been we've managed to keep in touch with most people um customer wise there's quite a few that still pick up their bread on a sort of you know weekly basis or bi-weekly basis so yeah we've been able to to keep you know briefly in touch with them and there's a you know we, we can kind of james quite we're quite popular in town he'll walk around with the dogs and you know he meets people um and when we go out i mean we, we see quite a lot of familiar faces and you know at the beginning they were all quite hesitant to stop and talk whereas now i think people are quite happy to actually you know take a minute and and talk to people for about what's been going on and how they've been doing because quite a lot of people will be by, there by themselves as well yeah so, and how important do you think that is in an area like Cumbria to, to be able to have that that ongoing relationship with the with the locals is is that do they make up a, a big part of your custom normally and and do you think that keeping them aware that you're around is going to be crucial to you um we'd like to think that we have a lot of the locals on side obviously not every you know but you can't have every can't win over everybody but um, there's quite a lot of people that, that are asking how we are doing, not just when we're opening, but how, how we're actually doing and if all our staff is all right. And um, yeah, I think and we, we do generally try and have a good relationship with local people by it's not all about kind of getting one over on another business or anything. It is quite a big community. And, and um, I know that a lot of the 
actually the sort of other B&Bs and things around have been in touch and just checking if you know we are how everybody's doing and just trying to kind of get together band together a little bit I suppose so yeah it's it I mean locals and the local trade is definitely very important and um, a lot of the actual local people are people that are supplying things to us as well so you know it's it's a bit of a give and take yeah as compared to places like cities where it might be a little bit less personal and you might need to focus on how much social media and stuff you do you keeping ties with, with people around you is probably very important and how about um is is it have you got a lease on both of your properties the three hairs and and the black ball uh, it's three hairs is on a lease at the moment yeah, yeah. And what's what's that been like in in terms of um, paying your rent and your interaction with your landlord? Um, it it's not been too it's not been exactly difficult or anything. I mean, it's been all right. It's I mean, it's not ideal, obviously, for us from a business perspective. But at the same time, you know, it, a lot of people have had to pay rent and pay pay you know pay other things out ongoing. You know, there's there's different things like equipment that we're leasing as well. Obviously, you'll have to keep that ongoing, yeah. or you can ask for you know re either reductions or delays. It it depends. It I think it can be. I don't think it's as mm. sort of detrimental as it might be for some people. And um, for us personally, I think it's it's been manageable. Yeah, good. So you feel in in relatively good stead to to get back into work when you when you do. Yeah, hopefully. I would say um, there's always little jobs that you find every time you enter the building that you think, oh, I'll, I'll do that. Or oh, I'll just paint a little bit of this. Or, um, you know, oh, this could really do with replacing. And you, you end up with like a list about, you know, three, four, a four pages full of things that you, the littlest things that you never had time when you first opened because it got busy or, you know, that have been the kind of wear and tear over the last two years. So, yeah, I think as long as we can keep, you know, carve a little bit of time out each each week, even going forwards, even when we reopen, to keep looking after us and after the building and everything. Yeah, I think we're pretty much. Yeah, we feel fairly confident that we're ready. I think. Yeah, and what are you looking at in terms of time frame? Will you reopen as soon as you're allowed to reopen, or are you kind of planning on waiting to see what what the sort of public's reaction is before you do? Um, I think as soon as we're allowed to, hopefully we'll get a little bit of warning. So whether that be two weeks or three weeks or just one week, um, I think if it was as little as one week, it'd be unrealistic for us to open maybe exactly then. I don't know. It depends on the staff as well. Obviously, they need a bit of notice before we can get them back in. And um, But yeah, we're hoping. I mean, there, there's a lot of speculation at the moment. I mean, some people are saying 22nd of June. There's been a lot of newspaper articles in the last two days that have been saying that, but the government hasn't issued any official, you know, statement on that. Um, and then others are saying, obviously, July. So if it was July, it, within the first or second week of July, we should be fine. You never really know if they've if they've got a plan if they're keeping it from you or if they're just. Yeah, yeah. Well, it will it will depend, and if it obviously gets a lot worse, um, I suppose they don't have a choice but to change probably the, the, their mind of what they have at the minute so yeah. the, is the summer an important time for you in terms of business uh yeah it can we we do have quite a steady trade over the winter as well which yeah. um seems surprising to some people when they come to ours because it seems quite quiet but um we do have a lot of sort of local trade and it's quite accessible um where we are but it, the summer does make a difference. I mean, there's a lot of people that go to the lakes and then probably branch out and come towards the Yorkshire Dales. Um, then there's a lot of, you know, families just generally that have family homes there or um, sort of second homes. We have a lot of um, just just tourism, I think, in general that we do we would rely on. And I mean, obviously, a lot more people come out to sit in the garden over the summer. So, I mean, the the weather we've had over the last two months was pretty much ideal for for sort of you know pub garden weather really yeah but we you know obviously have missed that <laughs> so um it, it is important and it is definitely busier than in the winter but i mean it is yeah it is what it is we can't we can't change it for this year yeah. uh, and i know some businesses are you know really wondering what they're going to do the, the seasonal destinations think about the sort of southern coast and stuff like that places like that 
they're the ones that are really going to take a hit if they can't open soon because they make a lot of their money in in the summer and then a lot yeah. of Christmas and then the rest of the year is tough. So it's it's good to hear that you guys have got something you know steady and sort of sounds sounds quite strong for whenever you get to get to reopen. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, we even if we open in July, I don't. I'm kind of wondering how many people will really jump in a car just to drive, you know, yeah. however long they have to drive straight away to go on a holiday. Um, I think some bookings have started coming in for after July um, or end of July. But in general, I mean, hopefully it will just, it will just be busy enough, you know. Okay. Um, that was a bit longer than I'd anticipated. Sorry for dragging on the subject. but. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> let's move on to talk a little bit more about you and your sort of career so far and how you came to be where you are uh i guess the, the first question is probably you know how and when did you decide that you wanted to become a chef um i wasn't really sure what i wanted to do until i was a bit until I probably was about 16 17 um I've, I've been always been interested in cooking and um my my mum was she was a good cook when it came to japanese food um she was a little bit a little bit experimental at times when it came to sort of fusion um my dad was a terrible cook um i can't even tell him that now uh, he he just loves the slow cooker or just anything in a pressure cooker you just put it all in put it on for 4 hours and then it's done and um it was, it was just horrifying things like bananas and scrambled eggs and things. So when, when my mum was ill when we were little, uh, when I was about 11 or 12, I just decided that I was going to be able to at least learn how to make soups and basic meals so that we would both not starve. I don't know how he ate it himself. But um, so it kind of started really from there and then just your typical teenage phase where you bake a lot, especially I think it might be a bit gender stereo stereotyping but it's a lot of girls obviously we get into baking and yeah. you know cakes and you know you have your friends around and things so it came really from there and because I couldn't decide what I wanted to do um I said I, I wouldn't mind you know going either into a kitchen or working for a zoo and I think my parents decision was that if I could combine going into a kitchen and going to university that would probably be better they were very um, Asian mindset that you have to have a degree in case you know just in case of anything really um, which is why I had to, I moved to the UK because in Germany it's all apprenticeships yeah I think there's some courses now but I think it's not really a, a similar kind of you know, it's definitely not a sort of university degree mm -hmm. um, so I went I went to do the culinary arts um, degree just a bachelor and then or was it was that in London yeah, it was in, in, in Ealing. Um, I think it's now the University of West London. Um, it used to be TVU. Um, so I went there, finished my course, and then I still wasn't sure if I wanted to be a chef. I always enjoyed the, the side in the school. So I've, all the sort of practical lessons and everything was fine. And the theory behind it was great. But I think fitting into an actual workplace, I found found quite hard. I think it was between a little bit between a language barrier. I mean, yeah. I wasn't bad at English. I was never bad at English as such, but... It English is, is perfect. <laughs> I mean, there's I mean, there's just a lot of, you know, sort of colloquialism. There's uh, sort of just your general, you know, sort of the, the palling around in the kitchen. Yeah. You either need to be quite, quite stubborn and, you know, kind of not let anything phase you if you can't understand them, or you really need to kind of fit in and, and joining yeah so I wasn't sure if I wanted to do that really um, mm -hmm. and I don't think I've ever ended up in a kitchen where there was a lot of sort of supportive it's sort of groups as such I mean there's a lot of kitchens are quite clicky and I think in London it's different it, it's a big pool of a lot of businesses and you, you're quite replaceable as such and you know in it, you do get that feeling a little bit every so often um, so I just decided I wanted to do my master's instead. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just decided I was going to stay in school a bit longer. So I did the master's in food policy, um, yeah. which was a bit of a shock to the system because there was, you know, 30, 40, 50 year olds in the same 
class as me and you know they had experience in NGOs and government bodies and they were advisors to different groups and um it it was yeah it was quite it was challenging it was definitely not as easy as I thought it would be hmm. um and I've heard a I lot think, of people doing masters say that <laughs> well it, it was just yeah it was it was I, I did it and I did I did I did all right yeah I, I finished um within a year and a half and I I just wish I would have maybe had a bit more experience when I actually did go in it's again it's something that you don't know until you've actually until you do it yeah um, and but then do you, I just, do you still think it was it was beneficial and it was worth doing yeah definitely yeah I think I probably would have benefited a little bit more if I had done it at a later stage but at the same time I don't think I would have done it if I had just gone into the industry and then I don't think I would have ever carved at any time mm. to go back to university I think it's quite rare that people do that when they get older especially in, the, in, the, in the industry especially I suppose yeah especially in, when you're not on the sort of food theory side I think it's especially when you're in the practical in the actual hospitality sector it's quite difficult to kind of make that conscious decision to to not do something where you're on your feet all the time anymore and just you know go back to school yeah um but yeah then i, I moved to germ i moved back to germany did um, some baking there and cookery school um where i was teaching a little bit and then i found a job in manchester where i met james and then from there we just decided to do farmers markets i don't know really how we got into that i think we just got talking to somebody local um, in a in a local sort of deli that we we went to every so often, and they were starting farmers markets in in sort of in Levenshulme, just on the outskirts, and we just kind of went we just went with it, and we quite enjoyed it, and we just decided to do more and more markets and try and venture into hot food, and that's how we kind of thought that we needed a base, which is why we found a cafe, yeah, in in Cumbria. So we just it kind of went from market stalls to street food to to cafe and we did want to keep up the market stalls but the cafe became so different so so busy that we just stopped that um we were still doing a, quite a bit of outside catering really um as well as the cafe and then two years ago I mean, we opened the bowl and yeah we, that was it really yeah and it, uh, am i right in thinking that james is from the area originally yeah, he's not far away. So he's from Ierby, which is near Kirby Lonsdale. I think Kirby Lonsdale is probably the most sort of famous place around here, yeah. um, around us immediately. Um, so yeah, he didn't grow up very far. He didn't he didn't know Setba that well when, when we first moved here, but he obviously knew the area in general. It, I've only seen pictures, but it looks like such a such a beautiful area to be. Yeah, he's shouting at me. So he's had family from around here. So his some his his granddad was from Denver, which is literally behind Sedba. Um and then he's got also his his mum has been working in the area and his his grandma and people and other people in the family have been working in services in, in various halls and uh, big houses in the area as well. So so he's technically he's been accepted as a local person, yeah. I think. Is that <laughs> <laughs> you think that's important in Cumbria or as a business? Um, I think in a way it is, yeah. It's. I think sometimes you meet people and they can be quite. They they'll tell you that you know it takes so long to get accepted and be part of it. I think it helps that it's said Bersé, the the largest town in the Ocean Hills. So there's so many people here. There's a lot of people that aren't actually from the area, and then obviously there's the real sort of you know locals that are, you know, the proper locals. Um, I think it helps that we have a business and yeah. that we're trying to not be off-putting to some to to locals by having something. I mean, some people still find it off-putting probably because they don't understand what entirely what we do. I mean, there's a lot of offal on the menu. Sometimes there was, you know, we, we'd serve different beer at the beginning and different wine, and it was all it wasn't all your sort of typical sort of pub experience um, or cafe experience even. Um, but I think by now, uh, people kind of get that we're not necessarily trying to be different for the sake of being different, but because we actually believe in what we do. And, and you know, it's, we do try and work. If, if there's, we do have some people that are from locally that work for us. And, and like I said, we, we buy local honey. We buy, bought local, you know, sort of the, the carpets are from 
from the sort of uh, local, not local sheep, but from the sheep breeds that, that are from the area, but, and people that actually live in the, in the town that own the company for the carpets and, you know, blankets that have been woven locally by a local person, you know, so that it's all kind of bringing it together with lots of different people from different sort of walks of life, I suppose, from the area and just by trying to work with the locals, I suppose. So yeah, it is, it yeah. is important. And I think, I mean, we have been told that it takes about 20 years apparently to become a proper local person, <laughs> but, um, it also helps. I mean, we've got a, we, our son is six, and he he we moved here when he was half a year, so he's practically kind of been raised. Well, he is he has been raised basically by by people around us. You know, the, the local nursery, the local babysitters, and and so yeah, it doesn't. It, sometimes you feel a little bit, you know, when when I don't understand the local accent of you know very <laughs> old Bergians, it feels a little bit bizarre. But yeah, for the most part, I think. Yeah, it, it can be quite important, I think. But we were so far touch wood quite lucky. Yeah. We accepted fairly quickly. Yeah. And it, is it because of where you are that you decided to open a gastropub as opposed to another type of fine dining restaurant? Or it, what, what sort of determined that choice for you? I think it was, it, I don't think it was a conscious decision as such. I think we were... It, because of the building of it because it had a it had rooms and it was obviously like an old coaching and already and when we took it over um there wasn't really a choice but to have that hotel side to it as well um and then just to have a fine dining restaurant wouldn't work entirely with the with the fact that we have a bar like a pub bar in there as well and with the clientele we have so it's not just people that are purely coming to dine there's a lot of people that are coming to dine and to stay over, but there'll be some business people and there'll be people that have, um, you know, they have business to do in the town or um, school parents of, um, of the private school uh, just around the corner. So I think it's to keep like a broader spectrum yeah. there. It, it kind of, it kind of just transformed into more of a gastropub, I think. Yeah. And how would you, if, if you were to describe it to someone who'd never seen it, how, like how would you describe the, the pub to, to people? Um, I think in terms of um, sort of menu, it's just quite eclectic. Mm -hmm. And um, there's always, I, I always think there's always something for anyone that, that, you know, that they would find at least one thing that they would eat. Yeah. Um, I'm sure other people will tell me otherwise. Um, in terms of deco, I think we we were trying to have kind of a, a quite a comfortable, approachable space, um, sort of in the bar area, and then in the restaurant to have a bit more of a sort of bringing the outside in, but having a sort of more slightly more elegant, you know, feel to it. It it does have a lot of sort of Asian Japanese slash um, Scandinavian touches in terms of um, the decor. In terms of furniture as well in the bedrooms um it is quite modern yeah but i don't think it's modern sort of in a way that you know where, where some modern art can kind of intimidate or put you off i think it's quite a sort of cozy space still yeah. lovely just a little bit more about your your food um what would you define as your sort of style of cooking and i don't mean necessarily you know modern european or whatever but the the what what sort of drives you and how would you explain your food to to someone that doesn't have a, a clue about what you do um i've we place quite a bit of a big emphasis on sort of seasonal and good quality produce i think it's it's so in terms of the meat it's quite important so we have a lot maybe because of where we are but also because of who we are we like to use a lot of beef and lamb so it's quite red meat dominant um we barely do any poultry apart from um so we do some wild fowl in the game season yeah. so we never have any we very rarely have chicken on um maybe some guinea fowl because it gets raised locally here as well um and it's important where the meat comes from and how it's fed and and basically, ultimately, I think it makes a massive difference on how it tastes. 
Yeah. Um, so the quality of the produce, the seasonality is well, of it as well. So we've had, we, we normally forage quite a bit. I mean, we've had quite a bit of time now to forage and obviously preserve some, some things. So um, it's, it's a combination of that and having something a little bit different um, that has sort of accents from where I'm from. So whether it be fermenting Japanese style or Asian style in general, or better to make a sauerkraut ourselves and always have that on, on hand and have a bit of an influence of the German and the Japanese throughout the menu as well. So you'll, you'll find some very typical Japanese dishes and sometimes you'll just find a bit of an sort of a nod to Japanese food in a in a sort of in a dish so it might sound quite sort of British but it will have Japanese influences in it as well and in terms of your influences obviously your your heritage and where you grew up uh played a big part in in how you view food and, and what what you do but who would you say in terms of chefs that you worked with was most influential in your in your career um in terms of chefs i mean there's quite a few i mean we 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 have a basically a never-ending library of cookbooks and all sorts of books to be honest um i always thought that when tommy banks first started he was quite interesting i wasn't too interested in him until about three years ago or something as much mm -hmm. so but looking at him a bit more or the, the things that he did at the beginning were quite interesting and in how they started up um there's i mean in terms of um food I've, i mean i've always quite admired scandinavia for yeah. their food and all the people that have over there that are basically you know everybody is amazing um but it, it they're not necessarily influences as such i always we just like to read things and pick up things and see what other people do and whether or not, I think quite a lot of things aren't exactly transferable. I think everybody does something quite unique and you do sometimes get swept up in it. You know, when you look at a lot of pictures or you're on Instagram yeah. or you're on your sort of social media and you look at loads of books and things and you think, Oh, that, that sounds amazing. And then this sounds amazing. And you know, Oh my God, I, I can't ever do this or whatever. But I think there are things that, you kind of that you just subconsciously they're there and they might sort of prod you in the right direction but i think ultimately you just need to do what you kind of want to do yeah if that makes sense it sounds yeah. sounds a little bit probably slightly big heavy because you say oh i don't need an influence but i think everybody does have an influence but i wouldn't say that there's one single person that yeah. i would say is, so it's is, cherry picking around for the things that you enjoy about yeah 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 and have you you were saying about really enjoying Nordic food. Have you have you been to if you've been to Norway, have you been to Sweden? Where where are the places that you No, so I would quite like to go obviously to Denmark. I would yeah. quite like to go to Sweden. Um Scandinavia has always been somewhere I wanted to go to. Um and actually my dad always wanted to live there. I don't know whether that's always had maybe an influence on me. Um sort of that growing up I knew that my dad wanted to live there, but we, he never really he never got posted out there by his company and he just basically never really made it there. Um, we couldn't personally, so me and James, we do want to go, um, but it, it's always winter that we have time off. Yeah. So it's always the worst time. So whether then restaurants are closed or it's far too cold and it's just not really worth going because it, you know, you don't really get the best out of it, I suppose. Um, so we did keep saying that, you know, maybe it was this year. I don't think it will be this year, obviously. <laughs> um but maybe it's like short trips maybe next year or the year after where we can do like you know if a few weekends or you know a week there or something where we can go and just kind of hop over because i think a lot of people do just sort of weekend trips over to specific restaurants that they want to go to so yeah I, yeah i definitely quite like to go and see i think it'd be very different i think it'd be very different from what i probably imagine as well from sort yeah. of from all these years but how about so it aside from the nordics whereabouts do you like to go and eat in the uk when you when you obviously have time and, and restaurants are open um we we like to try different places basically um we need to 
mostly keep within driving distance because we we either at work and then going after work or before work or you know we have obviously our son to work around who doesn't eat everything so it's you know or when he's um, sort of with a babysitter or something maybe we can go out it it's not as often um but we we try and go and have a mixture of things i think we try and go to some gastro pubs or just pubs with really good reputation around us um in the lakes we will also try and obviously with depending on uh, how much we can spend at the time um try and we've been to set veins last year or we'll go to a michelin star you know one michelin star which we are, where we have so many to pick from in the lakes obviously um with you know on a on an evening uh, so i don't think there's a single place where i would say where we enjoy more it's always nice to have a walk that ties in with a with a meal though yeah um quite often so we might try and do that um but generally yeah we, we'd be quite happy to just drive within um sort of an hour or two hours i say we i don't really like driving so james drives um, so he will drive about two hours. I think that's sort of two to two and a half hours is the furthest we'll go to to a good place. And we'll probably try and go out sort of once every two weeks or something if we can. It's quite unrealistic most of the time. Mm. So it probably ends up being once a month. Or... It's quite important. Yes, it is quite important to go out and to look at other people's things. I think sometimes I just want to go out though, or most of the times I just want to go out to forget about food in a way, which is <laughs> kind of by, by forgetting about what we do or what I, I do. Um, but it's something that we enjoy doing. So it's, 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 yeah, it's good to get out and to be able to see what other people are doing or, you know, how, how other areas look or what they do, you know, if, Sometimes you just stumble across things like how they display something or how they plate something or yeah, it, I suppose it is, yeah, it's definitely a part of, yeah, it's part of work really, in a yeah. way. Yeah, it, probably better in a way than only getting inspiration from Instagram, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a bit more realistic, I think, as well, once you see the real thing. Um, yeah, it's, it is, yeah. It, I, I think it's it's a combination of everything. I think food, because I think hospitality is quite, a, it's, it's basically everywhere. So whether you go into a shop or a deli or, you know, you're just going to pick up some takeout or you have a food out or something, it, it just, I think everything we do is just basically touches onto our work all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. Great. And just just to, um, to move on to, uh, obviously you were saying that you, um, made it into the top 50 gastro pubs you were ranked 26 is that right yeah 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 how did it feel to get that award did you did you go straight into the to the top 50 at 26 yes we did yeah we, we weren't part of it last year or anything um we didn't actually even think we were gonna be able to be part of it this year and then you know it was it was quite short-lived so far because it was only two months after you know that we we kind of went and picked up basically our place number 26 and then we've all got shut out shut down basically so it kind of feels a little bit you know we we'll, were quite yeah well hopefully it'll you know the people won't have forgotten that and it you know having that recognition will still bring people back to you as soon as you can you can reopen yeah hopefully yeah how does it feel being a woman in a high-end you know in, in a restaurant that's been recognized on a on a national scale and what do you think that the implications of that are for other women in the industry um i never really in a way think about it that way i mm -hmm. think it it was just wh where we got i think it's just we work because of what we do and how we work i think it had nothing to do with so to speak i was never really thinking about the fact of that gender would have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, I I think. I mean, I hopefully it will it will encourage other people to maybe work just as hard or to work and try and you know and see that it's obviously not out of reach to would regardless of what gender you are yeah. to, to have some recognition and and basically that if you can 
you can come from anywhere and, and you know kind of be anything and it's just very cheesy but you no, we, but we true. I suppose kind of, the whole point of this kind of career is that you can defy the odds and no matter where you're from what yeah I, th I do think it's it was different for us I mean we because we started with ourselves and it was just me for a little bit and then it was always me you know in there um it was kind of not easier but it was it was basically it was kind of just me and James and whereas if I had been in a big brigade I think it would be very different I don't know where I would have ended up if I'd stayed in the kitchen basically yeah. um I don't I couldn't honestly tell you I think sometimes I mean I've I've got a lot of male colleagues and a lot of guys in the kitchen and I think sometimes when they get a bit rowdy I do think if I was 10 years younger how would I feel if if I was in here and you know the way they act and the, what they talk about I I mean saying that I do now fit in and you know because it's my workplace and if it was making me feel uncomfortable it would be the wrong workplace um but yeah, it's. I'm not sure. I'm. I think. I hope that it will encourage other people to, to try and you know sort of make it through the kitchen. I think the first, especially the first five years of something, are really hard. We 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 host well, in normal times. We host um, college tours, so we go into colleges and we talk to students that, you know, aspire to to work in hospitality. And I was. I'm always struck by how many. Um, if there are women on our panel, which we try and do, obviously, every time, how many girls come to us and tell us how, you know, how important it is to them to see that there are female role models in the industry. And it, it might seem, I don't know, because of the, the whole debate around it, it, it might seem a little bit overplayed, but to hear that from young girls saying, you know, I feel empowered and I feel like braver now going into what I want to do because I can see that it's possible is... Um, yeah that was it was kind of surprising and and good to good to hear i think yeah, yeah i think if if i had seen more female leaders I suppose 15 years ago or something maybe i should have been looking for it a little bit as well i suppose in our university teaching wise we had some very strong female chefs i mean a couple of them were pastry chefs as as most people would probably expect mm. um but they did really well for themselves. I mean, they trained people for the sort of, you know, world championships in um, in UK skills. They do, you know, the world chocolate championships and have um, actually furthered talents like Alistair Bird, who works as a head pastry chef in Harrods. He was just a year beneath, below me. But again, she chose someone that was male. I don't know. Is that, is that, you know, would it have made a difference if it was a female chef? I, I'm not sure. Um, I suppose it, yeah, it, it just, for us, it just kind of was an organic journey yeah. where we ended up. Um, and I can see that, I can see that we, we will, you know, hopefully if somebody will, you know, listens to this or something, um, that it will, it will sort of influence them and encourage them to do what they do want to do. I think you just need to be aware that there will be some uphill, uphill struggles, whether that's a gender struggle or not, it will be, it will be, you know, it will be quite hard. Yeah. Um, it will be, it will be just hard work, and you just need to persist with it. And it doesn't. It, that's just hospitality. I think people just <laughs> kind of think you walk into it, and it's really nice and really easy. Whether you're out front, you just talk to a lot of people in the kitchen. You know, you just do make a little bit of food, and you know, you get to do your own thing. Unfortunately, it's not quite as easy as that. But I think it is definitely quite rewarding. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it's, and I do think you can do quite a lot. You can, you can be, you can run your own business. You can, or you can be a head chef or you can be a head pastry chef. You can be a front of house manager, whatever you want to be. And you can have your own family and children and pets and hobbies. And I think most people don't realize that that work life balance, most people do manage to, you know, they do manage to, to do it. And I think, yeah, I think it's it's definitely something that you should encourage, especially young girls, yeah. to keep pursuing altogether. There's no, no compromise to be made. It's interesting that you say that because I think that's something that's really changed in the past 10, 15 years is that 
people in the hospitality industry have pushed to have that sort of work-life balance and have seen the the sort of merit of it all the way up you know all the way up to the managers and the people owning the businesses seeing a value of giving that to their teams because it's it's not just good for the business but it's good for their staff's mental health and overall that just it, it yeah. just work together to make sure that you have um sort of sustainable business really yeah yeah no it is it's um we do try and it does ultimately kind of end up with me having to cover people when you know in, in my in my part at least when they need to do certain things but you know i would expect for somebody to do the same for me so i think yeah we it'd be not i mean at the, when we when we come out of lockdown we will only do sort of four or five days at first um which will hopefully again ease people into working as well and it will retain you know sort of i mean they only work five days anyway so it's not like we don't you know we kind of slave trade them to you know to working seven days a week but it will ease them back into it and hopefully you know we won't we all won't lose that work-life balance because it is quite nice like i said at the beginning we to have more time to actually have a day set aside to do things that i want to do and not just you know kind of what's good for the business and oh i forgot to do this yesterday so i better nip back and you know yeah well not not to sound cheesy but it's it's good to kind of get back in touch with who you are as a person and separate yeah. that it is quite difficult. I mean, we, we've, we've had our son obviously six years ago. So it went from, from being busy to being kind of the milk bag and then being, you know, trying to get used to the fact that you're, you're suddenly a mother as well. And, um, I mean, James does an awful lot. He does more with Ernest in terms of schooling and everything than me, because I've got less patience with him really, but it, it's that whole journey. And then, now sort of six years on he's quite independent suddenly you know he can do a lot of things by himself and he goes to school and you know especially now that he's in school and we have sort of five six hours to ourselves all of a sudden you sort of kind of realize that there is more than you know you are like i said you are just your own person aren't you you you, you're not just you're not just a part of 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 a family or just running a business so it is yeah, it's definitely important to retain that a little bit. Coronavirus aside, how your feelings are about the Black Bull and where it stands, and I guess what you project for the future for the next couple of years. So hopefully we will come out of this and recover, you know, within fairly quickly. Well, mm-hmm. That's that's a hope. Um, but in the next couple of years, well, hopefully we'll be able to retain like places like in the top fifty gastropubs um, and grow that even more obviously grow the food as we go along um and we have quite a lot of outside space so we have some plans with what we ideally want to do with our sort of garden and sort of area outside and and um sort of little other projects um we are sort of in possibly in the progress of changing three hairs over a little bit from just a cafe maybe introducing a little bit of a retail side and sort of a deli side to it as well so it's little bits and then that will just take us already to next year and then hopefully in the few years after that to whether whether it will we'll be looking at other ventures to add to or maybe just to to like I said really grow the outside area by adding you know a sort of an individual sort of bake sort of like a little bakehouse on the outside rather than having to have everything on the inside because it's quite a big big quite important to me um or maybe to just extending some of the the sort of um the rooms so whether or not we can have maybe a bit more bit a couple more rooms in the outside we have a cottage that's not been used um how, sorry i didn't even ask how many have you got at the moment we have 18 okay so we we have a cottage that's been kind of derelict for the last few years i mean we have been it's been cleaned out um but we could turn that into more rooms or something so whether or not that's maybe the first thing to come we'll just have to see where at the end of this year and then the beginning of next year really takes us in terms of yeah recovery and and yeah so that's i think that's quite important and yeah wishing you wishing you all the best thank you very much for taking the time to, to speak to me today and thank uh, you for starting, yeah. <laughs> thank you we hope you enjoyed this interview and if you have 
any comments, feel free to tweet us or comment on the post. Uh, we're making all of our interviews available to download. And finally, if you like what we do, whether it's our podcast or our videos or even our features, please head over to our Patreon page and support us there. This episode of Grilled by the Staff Canteen is sponsored by Westlands, the premier specialist British grower of microleaf, growing cresses, edible flowers, inspired leaves, sea herbs and specialty tomatoes. Visit www.westlandsuk.co.uk to find out more.